Good, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome back both in the room and online to the second afternoon of this investigation of R.A. Fisher in the 21st century. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker now, um, Dr. Rachelle, oh, sorry, I've, I asked the name and she told me the name and I've just got it wrong, Rachel. That's right, Rachel Sanchez Rivera, um, who did her undergraduate degree um, in political science and history at Puerto Rico University, um, and then studied at Columbia University before coming to Cambridge to do their PhD um, in uh, sociology. Uh, their thesis was on what happened to Mexican eugenics, and I think we'll hear some elements of that now. Um, they have a, a wonderfully rich um, and quite urgent body of, of research and, and publications. Um, for example, a paper on the legacies of race science, anti-Chinese racism and COVID-19 in Mexico, which appeared in 2020. Um, and a particularly nice um, paper on the making of La Gran Familia Mexicana eugenics, gender, and sexuality in Mexico, um, published in the Journal of Historical Sociology. Um, they're working on a book on what happened to Mexican eugenics, racism, and the reproduction of the nation. And I suspect that the concept of slippery eugenics will be um, part of that, um, exploring the, the manifold ways in which eugenics has changed shape. Um, and appeared in different guises. And I think that's something very important for us to recognize. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction. So, um, so this is an R.A. Fisher conference, and I'm not gonna talk about R.A. Fisher directly. I'm sorry about that. But I'm just gonna focus on the transnational connections of eugenics in the Americas and the different legacies of eugenics today. Um, so the title of this presentation is going to be The Histories and Legacies of Eugenics and in its intersections with race, class, disability, and gender. Um, so as shown in the abstract for this conference, this presentation will examine how historically specific ideas of race, ability, gender, and class became scientific truths. I will also explain, uh, examine the legacies and contemporary implications of having the respectability and objectivity of science behind racist beliefs. In turn, this presentation will examine how this seemingly or assumed scientific truths slip into contemporary academic, cultural, social, and nationalistic understandings of science, medicine, and politics. I will use uh, examples from different settings and contexts with a special focus on the Americas. I'll start by discussing a brief history of eugenics and how this gets to the Americas in different ways from the sterilization of people considered as unfit with the case of Buck versus Bell in 1927. Um, I'll then talk about how uh, eugenic practices and ideas affected the ways in which segregation policies in the U.S. were being carried out. And then I'll talk more broadly about the force and coerced sterilization practices and policies uh, targeted to black and Latinx communities in the U.S. and different colonial spaces like Puerto Rico. I will then discuss the instances of resistance to conclude with the more, the, with the more contemporary legacies um, of uh, eugenics uh, in the Americas. And lastly, I believe that it is important to understand eugenics uh, beyond its intellectual debate to observe the ways in which eugenic practices and its legacies still disproportionately affect the working class, people of color, women, people constructed as disabled, among many other historically pathologized groups. So I do not want to repeat what some of my colleagues have already said, but I'll, just for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I'll explain eugenics very briefly. 
The term eugenics was coined by Sir Francis Galton, who used it in print for the first time in his book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and Its Development, published in 1883. Galton coined the word uh, from the Greek eugenics, uh, namely in good stock and in daub in terms of heredity, with what he called noble qualities. The term responded to a particular concern of his, the science of improving the stock, a phenomenon he regarded as equally applicable to men, brutes, and plants. So for Galton, eugenics was not a passive process, but a science which was, as he stressed, by no means confined to the questions of judicious mating, uh, but with which, uh, especially in the case of men, uh, takes cognizance of all the influences uh, that tend, in however remote a degree, to give the most suitable races or strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable than they otherwise would have had. And this is a direct quote, quote from Galton. So basically, in Galton's views, like um, science had the power and authority to influence and guide individuals' mating choices in order to ameliorate the qualities and potential of the broader population. However, uh, this does not come in a vacuum. Uh, in an early book uh, titled Hereditary Genius, written in 1868, Galton argued that the eminence and talent closely aligned to abler races, a, th a theme that he repeated in later works of uh, eugenics. So the most important thing we need to take uh, from this is that what differentiated eugenics uh, from other contemporaneous research into these themes was Galton's explicit interest in applying science to society as a means of rationalizing and improving populations. However, he refers specifically uh, to the improvement of the most suitable uh, races. Galton subscribed uh, to different racial theories uh, and hierarchies of the time, uh, what we now term as uh, scientific racism. Uh, for example, in his work, um, Inquiries into Human Faculty and its Development that I was talking about earlier, he saw eugenics as a way of emphasizing particular characteristics that he saw as already inherent to different populations while weeding out bad traits. And this is where we can observe like different uh, racializing, gendered, classist, and ableist undertone is, uh, in his analysis, like especially uh, when it comes to the pathologization of the working class. Um, now, um, I wanted to talk about uh, eugenics in the United States. So eugenics uh, rapidly became very influential uh, in mainstream, uh, like basically mainstream science in the United States. These practices became a way to weed out the population from quote unquote undesirable traits. The height of its popularity in the United States was from the end of the 19th century to the mid 20th century but its legacies, as we will see in this presentation, still continue. But before going into the contemporary examples, I'll discuss the case of Buck versus Bell. So according to Eli Clare's article titled, Coming from the Field, Yearning Toward uh, Carrie Buck, she states that, and I quote, sex workers, immigrants, people of color, poor white people, people with psychiatric disabilities, people with epilepsy, so-called sexual deviants, blind people, deaf people, physically disabled people, unmarried women who had sex, effeminate men, prisoners, intellectually disabled people were all deemed feeble-minded at one time or another. The list uh, basically kept shifting over the decades, but the meaning of the word stayed the same inferior, immoral, disposable. Eugenics declare feeble-mindedness as something inherently genetic. Its followers firm, firmly believe the material conditions of poverty and violence to be hereditary traits. Uh, 
Through it all, feeble-mindedness drew its fundamental power from the hatred and fear of disability. In this specific case, the supposed imbecile in question was Carrie Buck. By then, a 21-year-old working-class woman from Charlottesville, uh, Virginia. At the age of 17, Carrie Buck became pregnant as a result of rape by a relative of her foster parents. Following the birth of her child, Carrie was committed to, uh, to the Virginia colony uh, for epileptics and feeble-minded, uh, the same institution that housed Carrie's birth mother, uh, Emma Buck, on also the grounds of feeble-mindedness. Around that time, a uh, Virginia legislature uh, had just passed away um, a new law calling for the sterilization of mental defectives. Passed during the height of the eugenics movement in the United States, this law stated that sterilization would promote both the health of the individual patient, but also the welfare of society. However, there were many eugenicists that wanted to pass like, different sterilization laws at a more national, or in the case of the United States, like federal level. So they basically sued themselves using Carrie Buck's name in order to go to the Supreme Court. This law, at the end of the day, passed in 1927, and Carrie Buck, her sister, and her mother were all sterilized. And I will read uh, one of the most famous excerpts uh, from this law on the slide here that I forgot to push, sorry. Um, we have seen more than once that the public welfare may call upon the best citizens for their lives. It would be strange if it could not call upon those who already sap the strength of the state for these lesser sacrifices, often not felt to be such by those concerned, in order to prevent our being swamped with incompetence. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory va vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. So at the end of the day, like this um, new decree from the Supreme Court um, allowed uh, a lot or most of the states in the United States to pass different sterilization laws that would follow eugenic precepts, as you can see uh, on the map here. Um, these laws were mostly used to sterilize all of those deemed undesirable or unfit to be part of the great U.S. nation, um, a common rhetoric that we see nowadays with Make America Great Again. As mentioned earlier, these laws would mostly target Latinx communities, black women, people with divergent, or as they would call it uh, historically, uh, deviant sexuality, sex workers, the feeble-minded, or as we now call it, people with disabilities, among many other bodies constructed as abnormal or pathological. So this is uh, where we see how everything and everyone that fell outside of the norm of a healthy seed would be forced to sterilization. And this did not only happen in the, in the US. In reality, because eugenics was considered a mainstream modern um, keeping in with the times and popular science, the control of population and reproduction was coming all over the world. So um, I will now just like mention a couple of like examples on the different transnational connections of eugenics in the Americas and beyond. For instance, um, during the early 20th century, eugenicists and eugenic ideas spread all over the world, as I said before, as this was considered a legitimate science. So here we can see the transnational connections of eugenics um, in the Caribbean and the United States. 
I think uh, one of the most important things that we need to get out of studying eugenics is that it gave scientific racism, or what we now term as scientific racism, the tools for social adaptation. If we follow Conroy, eugenics pretty much became a secular religion in which everyone could be a part of. For example, as you can see on the slide, uh, Charles Davenport here, um, is one of the most, like, who is one of the most famous eugenicists in the US, um, actually used places like the Caribbean to experiment and put forward his theories against miscegenation. For those uh, of you who do not know what miscegenation is, miscegenation is the mixture of the races. This was something that was used uh, very differently in different uh, countries according to their own context. But in the case of Davenport, he was against the mixing of the races as he was using the US racial understanding of racializing processes and structural racism, or as we commonly call it, the one drop rule. Um, he used Jamaica as an example as to why miscegenation was bad, arguing that the offspring of miscegenation were more prone to things like criminal acts, feeble-mindedness, among other things. Davenport tried to do a similar thing with Latin American eugenicists by drafting a code of eugenics at the third Pan American meeting of eugenics and homiculture in 1937. Davenport joins forces with Domingo Ramos, who was a Cuban eugenicist, and they collaborated to create this code which condemned miscegenation. Because the main platform for eugenic ideas and practices in Latin America relied on mestizaje, or mixed raceness or racial mixture, um, most Latin American eugenics did not like this new proposal. However, we should not confuse mestizaje or mixed raceness with something that was intrinsically good, as it was also very exclusionary, but we will get back to this. Um, however, Davenport continued to be part and participate in, uh, in different eugenic societies throughout Latin America, like Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil. So despite Davenport being a more avid supporter of Weismanian eugenics and Latin Americans being supportive of Lamarckian eugenics, did this, this did not stop them from converging these theories of heredity and eugenics to produce their own needs according to their own contexts. However, there are some instances in which like Lamarckian eugenicists like, would collaborate more with each other. Um, for example, like Conrado Gini and Gilberto Loyo. So Conrado Gini was an Italian fascist, eugenicist, and demographer who did a research project with other Italians and Mexican eugenicists as he believed that the Seri community in Mexico had the purest race of indigenous people. This resulted in a publication titled An Investigation of Some Indian Tribes in Mexico, published in 1934 in one of the most renowned eugenic journals uh, titled Eugenic News. Similarly, uh, Gilberto Loyo, uh, who was a Mexican demographer, was sent to study eugenics and demography uh, with Conrado Gini in Italy. When he came back, he did the general population law in Mexico in 1936, which was based on eugenic principles of population control in terms of mostly exclusionary migratory uh, policies. Thus, despite the common racializing trope in Mexico being mestizaje or mixed raceness, there was a very specific type of mixture that privileged, in turn, um, and, like, and at the same time would exclude everything outside of that preferred form of mixture. That, in the specific case of Mexico, would be the mixture between white men and indigenous women. In this example, uh, we see a clear convergence uh, of Weismanian and Lamarckian eugenics. Uh, Renato Kell was a famous Brazilian eugenicist who founded the first eugenic society uh, in Brazil and in Latin America in 1917. Even though the first society of eugenics here was very short-lived, uh, 
ideas spread and eugenic practices remained. Uh, for example, in different exclusionary migration laws like segregation policies, hygienic policies, like um, among others in Brazil. Uh, for example, uh, after the abolition of slavery in 1888, which is like the country that does abolish slavery uh, last in the world, uh, Brazil actually put very strict migratory laws that preferred white people from Latin-based countries as a way for them to assimilate to this new and modern Brazilian nation. Kell's works were mostly about Lamarckian eugenics and the support of miscegenation uh, through racial mixture, or as they would call it, mestizagem. However, after a research trip to Germany during the 1930s, he started favoring more Weismannian eugenics. Nonetheless, despite the, his newfound connections, some Latin American eugenics, uh, eugenicists like, would actually cherry pick his ideas both before the 1930s and after, depending on their own needs and depending on their own contexts, which only shows like, how fickle eugenic ideas were at the end of the day. Another connection of eugenics uh, was Franz Boas and Manuel Gamio. Uh, Gamio, uh, who was Mexican, was a student of Boas uh, during his time at Columbia University in the city of New York. Boas was an anthropology professor at Columbia who advocated against scientific racism while using the tools and language of race science, which as we will see um, with like, his students and the legacies that he left, like, proved to be quite problematic. This too would frame themselves as anti-racist anthropologists, but people like Gamio, for example, uh, was a member of the Society of Eugenics in Mexico and even made a beauty context titled La India Bonita, translated roughly to uh, the most beautiful Indian uh, in 1921 as a way of making indigenous women more desirable to criollo or white men. Gamio believed that the future of the Mexican nation relied on this respectable indigenous woman marrying white men. This to him was the basis of mixed raceness or mestizaje in Mexico. As you can see, this is a very exclusionary way of thinking about mixed raceness as it invisibilizes anything that is outside of this acceptable mixture. So in a nutshell, Afro-Mexicans, indigenous men, Chinese and Japanese people, among others, were systematically invisibilized from this national idea of mixed raceness or mestizaje. It was not until the final solution and the genocidal atrocities committed by the Nazis during the Second World War that a widespread condemnation of race science, especially eugenics ideas, emerged. The 1950 UNESCO meeting was the first international attempt to stop using the word race and starting using the word e ethnic groups. Nonetheless, racial groupings remain as Ashley Montagu, which was the original drafter of the Statement on Race uh, of 1950, argued that there were three main categories of humanity. And I'm going to quote here, and I'm using the taxonomy of the time, so I apologize. First one being the mongoloid division, the second one being the N-word division, and the third one being the Caucasoid division, which, w which all had subdivisions and varieties of ethnic groups beneath them. This statement received major international backlash, so the UNESCO issued yet another statement on race in 1951 with ethnic groups and ethnicity functioning as euphemisms for race, which could lead one to erroneously infer that race and racial categories um, do not matter anymore. Efforts to invisibilize the term race erased the long history of racialization processes and stripped away the language necessary to challenge racism. Thus. While the term race started to fall from grace as a biological category, the UNESCO statement reinscribed the notions embedded in race science through a different terminological toolset. <laughs> 
This so-called retreat of scientific racism marks a changeover in race thinking. By the late 1960s, colorblind racism acquired a certain sense of cohesiveness and authority. Under colorblind racism, according to Eduardo Bonilla Silva, and I quote, whites have developed powerful explanations which have ultimately become justifications for contemporary racial inequality that ex exculpate them from any responsibility for the status of people of color. I think we have seen this uh, countless times, from racist monuments to the death, or better said, murder of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Rodney King, and the list goes on and the killing in plain sight by a white miner in Kenosha uh, who was let go, crossed state lines, and passed away with impunity. So we need to think about different processes of racialization. We need to think about the systematic nature of racism. And we also need to think about how whiteness as an organizing principle operates. So in a nutshell, colorblind racism allows for the usage of methodologies and ideas developed during the period of scientific racism without using the terms that are now cataloged as a pseudoscience. These dynamics allow for the creation, maintenance, and resurgence of ideas rooted in scientific racism. In the United States, Jim Crow segregation policies and practices were implemented uh, from the 19th century to the mid-1960s. It is important to say that segregation practices went beyond water fountains and segregated schools and buses, which is horrible enough already. It is important to understand that this segregation laws and practices go to the point of dehumanizing individuals, and furthermore, they are systematic as they are endorsed by the status quo. Jim Crow and the systems of segregation made use of eugenics and scientific racism more broadly to put in place these dehumanizing practices. Thus, even if this finished in the mid-1960s, this segregatory -like system is still very much present in the systemic dimensions of white supremacy and anti-blackness. So despite that these laws were supposedly eradicated, what we will see in this presentation is that different practices allow for different segregation practices and in in systemic racism nowadays. So the question remains, was there really a retreat of scientific racism or did, they just, did this just like hide in the shadows? Did a new language emerge to condone these practices? And this is what I study like through my term, slippery eugenics. Throughout the 20th century and even after the 1960s in the United States, the state and different federal policies have targeted black and brown women to get sterilized uh, without their consent, and sometimes this were coerced to undergo these operations. For instance, Mexican women uh, were forced and coerced to undergo eugenic sterilization in California all throughout the 20th century. Black women were also disproportionately sterilized, and they were coerced by medical professionals to get sterilized because of eugenic reasons. In Puerto Rico, a colony of the United States since 1898, and a colony of Spain before then, one in three women in reproductive age were sterilized by the mid-1970s. People like President Roosevelt, for example, uh, argued that a better Puerto Rico was a Puerto Rico with no Puerto Ricans. This is still a very real thing in Puerto Rico, as issues like climate change, environmental racism, and population control measures have allowed this to continue well, uh, like during uh, the 21st century. So under Population Control Law 116 of 1937 in Puerto Rico, institutionalized encouragement of sterilization through the use of door-to-door -door visits by health workers, financial subsidy of the operation, 
by both federal and local government, and industrial uh, employer favoritism towards uh, sterilized women push women towards having a hysterectomy, tubal ligation, or colloquially like the operation or tying the tubes. The coercive strategies used by these institutions denied women access to informed consent. More than one third of the women in 1968 survey uh, did not know that sterilization through tubal ligation was a permanent form of contraception. The euphemism tying the tubes made women think that the procedure was easily reversible. Also, some of the health professionals like, would only talk to women in, in English, despite Spanish being the only or primary language that they spoke. Eugenic practices and ideas that were around the 19th century and converge when elites and the US federal government not only perform force and coerced sterilization procedures for Puerto Rican women, but also tested the first contraceptive measures um, in Puerto Rico during the, well, 1947 onwards. Puerto Rican women that were experimented on were usually dark skin, uh, black, and working class. They did not know that they were being the testing vessels for the contraceptive pill and contraceptive foams. As a result, they received 18 times more hormones than the contemporary contraceptive pill, which resulted in many different um, symptoms like from thrombosis or like internal bleeding uh, to even cancer. This is all to say that while white women saw uh, this as a sexual revolution during the 1960s, um, it was because of the coercion, sterilization, and experimentation of black and brown women in a colonized setting of the global south that they were able to have access to the contraceptive pill. So we have to think sexual revolution for whom, why did we create this uh, contraceptive pill? Was it because of eugenics measures? Like what is the role of scientific racism here? And this series of questions like, were not first posed by me, were first posed by different black feminists and feminists of color who saw the disproportionate amount of cases of women of color subjected to forced and coerced sterilization practices. For instance, if you wanna know more about it, I recommend you read Angela Davis, Loretta Ross, uh, among many other black feminists. But one of the most important things uh, apart from academic works that engage with this, was the coining of the reproductive justice framework in 1994 by the activist group Sister Song. Here, they would call out this population control measures targeted to people that have been historically pathologized by eugenic ideas and scientific racism by using an intersectional analysis. Nonetheless, um, despite activist movements and different organizations calling out reproductive injustices, still continue to this day. For instance, uh, this that you see here on the slide just came out uh, by mid-September of the year 2020. I'm sure that most of you are familiarized like in some way uh, with ICE detention centers in the United States, but if you're not, uh, these are detention centers mostly for Latinx communities who came to the United States illegally. Uh, among the countless human rights violations that they suffer every single day, especially in a post-COVID world, uh, during the mid-September of 2020, we found out by whistleblower uh, that ICE doctors uh, were doing uh, forced uh, hysterectomies to women in these det detention centers. Um, unfortunately, even though like we found out about this in September 2020, uh, nothing has come out of uh, calling this atrocities. However, um, like this sterilization practices like are not the only example. There are countless examples. I decided to put like just a few here, but we can talk about it more in the comments section and the the Q and A. Uh, but I am. Just saying this because I want to reiterate that the legacies of eugenics are still very much present in today's world. 
And this is why eugenics is still very much important to be discussing and to be talking about. Uh, so yeah, these eugenic sterilization practices are not a thing of the past. For instance, uh, here uh, in Peru, more than 350,000 indigenous women were sterilized without their consent from the period of 1996 to 2000. So in a period of only four years uh, under the mandate of President uh, Fujimori. And despite protests like being made and different uh, instruments like, like the Kibu project that if you want, I can show you that uh, webpage like during the Q&A, nothing concrete has been done as a way of punishing the Peruvian state. There has been effort uh, made by the international fear, uh, but for example, like only two weeks ago, uh, President Fujimori, the Peruvian president that led the efforts uh, of this population control measures, was received the pardon uh, for these atrocities. And that was only two weeks ago. So apart from uh, reproductive injustices, if I haven't made my case already, Another remnant of eugenics is the prison system and the targeting of criminality uh, to specific communities according to racialization processes. During the time of eugenics as a popular and legitimized science, uh, there was a lot of theorization behind the links between criminality, feeble-mindedness, vagrancy, and race. Uh, we saw this earlier, for example, uh, uh, with uh, Charles Davenport claims about miscegenation in Jamaica and mixed race people, according to him, being more prompt to degeneration and criminality. These links were so clear that eugenicists started making different laws to criminalize, um, criminalize people according to racist stereotypes by hiding it under the cloak of science, medicine, and eugenics, and public policy for that matter. For instance, in Mexico, different courts were made to regulate the bodies of unruly adolescents that came from rural areas uh, of Mexico, which is another way of saying indigenous. So it was another way of targeting indigenous uh, and criminalizing indigenous populations. The United States is one of the clearest, but not the only example of this. The U.S. Uh, has the biggest industrial prison uh, complex in, in the whole world, and some of its sectors are pri uh, like part of the private realm. Hence, uh, the contracts or care of inmates uh, are usually passed down to private subsidiaries. Uh, therefore, it becomes a market-based prison complex intersecting with ideas rooted in white supremacy and scientific racism. As you can see from the PowerPoint, uh, the rate in which people get imprisoned is intersected by class and gender, but most of all is intersected by racialization processes and systemic racism. Uh, with black people and Latinx individuals being at the highest rate of imprisonment in the US carceral system, especially like in uh, comparison to like the total of the population. Um, however, it even goes beyond this because like after these people get in prison and go back to civilian life, they have to go through weekly checkups uh, and check-ins like, and the chances of getting a job are slim to none. And that's without even counting the people that are just stopped in search uh, just due to racial profiling, uh, not only on the streets but also airports, uh, supermarkets, stores, and even at their own homes. So just to wrap up, or as a form of conclusion, uh, despite eugenics uh, being a science that fell from grace after the atrocities committed in the mid 20th century during the war, uh, World War II, race science is still very much embedded in our understanding of society, culture, and scholarship. So it is important to keep discussing uh, the legacies that these ideas and practices still have on different bodies rather than just looking at it as an intellectual exercise with very little relevance to the world today but because it still has a lot of relevance to the world today. So 
I'm going to leave it here. Thank you very much, and I cannot wait to hear your comments and questions.